In Easy Rider's Raging Bulls, he dissected the groundbreaking era of 70s filmmaking and the overwhelmingly talented and colorful characters who populated it. In Down and Dirty Pictures, he took on Harvey Weinstein, Sundance, and the founders of the independent film movement. Now, acclaimed journalist and author Peter Biskind tackles his most challenging and elusive subject yet, Warren Beatty. In his new book, Star, How Warren Beatty Seduced America, Mr. Biskind examines the career of this charismatic actor with his usual sure-handed Hollywood-worthy formula, that is to say, equal parts film love and irresistible dish. This formula has created a buzz, both, both positive and negative, amongst the film community, as have all of his works. And for that reason, and many others, it's become the hottest filmmaker biography we've had in years. And you can actually purchase the book by clicking on the front cover icon on that home page where you're listening to the show now. Here is Mr. Biskin discussing the origins of the book, the controversy surrounding its juiciest bits, and the intricacies of his fascinating subject. What made you choose Beatty as a subject, especially when you've covered the, the decade of his prominence in the 70s so, so thoroughly with Easy Riders? Well, I, you know, I was aware at the time that, you know, because I covered so many people, you know, not only Beatty, but, you know, Scorsese, Coppola, Bogdanovich, Freakin, you know, mm -hmm. Spielberg, Lucas, etc., um, that, you know, there was plenty of uh, material left for each one of those people, you know, and there's been, you know, there have been a number of biographies of Coppola, and Scorsese and um, and Spielberg and Lucas. So um, I, I felt I only skimmed the surface, even though there was a lot of material in that book. And uh, when I looked at the, um, you know, when I looked at those people and, and started thinking about who would I like to pull out for a full-scale biography, uh, Betty sort of popped out at me because um, you know a lot of those people were. Um, and I don't, use, I don't mean to use this term in a derogatory, disparaging way, film geeks, mm -hmm. and which is to say that their whole lives were um, devoted, at least what I mean is their whole lives were devoted to film, and there wasn't um, much left. You know, in other mm -hmm. words, they didn't um, participate in, you know, they didn't uh, do much else. I mean, Scorsese, for example, lives for film. Right. And there's nothing wrong with it. But... Um, I was sort of, sort of looking for somebody who had other um, other interests as well to complement the film material. And Beatty, of course, had a uh, you know participated in politics uh, very fully, and uh, he also knew everybody. You know, so mm -hmm. that there were a lot of stories that he had to tell about other people. You know, from you know everybody from JFK to um, you know to Bob Dylan and. Uh, uh, and he he collected people. You know, you know, you could be riding in his car and um, the phone would ring, and there would be John McCain asking him for advice. And then ten minutes later, the phone would ring, and there would be Ralph Nader. You know, on mm. all sides of the political spectrum. And then, of course, there were the women. You know, he was famous for being a Don Juan. You know, lady killer, um, heartbreaker. You know, whatever. So, Beatty had. There were multiple um, facets of Beatty's life that attracted me, and I thought that would made him a particularly good um, uh, um, candidate for a biography. And plus, at the time that I conceived this, there really weren't any um, decent Beatty biographies. So um, that was another, you know, whereas, you know, there were a number of things on Coppola, and, you know, did, we, did the world need another one? Yeah, and, and in your personal meetings with him, I know you've met him several times over the years, and even a couple of times in reference to the beginnings of this book, describe him to me because he, he strikes me as very uh, enigmatic but charming, uh, but 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 very guarded. Is that accurate? Well, that's yeah, you know, that's accurate. I mean that and that and you know you sort of touched on the last final reason um, why, why I was interested in doing him is because I had a relationship with him that went back twenty years. Uh, you know, and I've written about him many, many times, both for Premier Magazine and also for Vanity Fair. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think you described him very well um, just now. I mean, he's very, very charming, um, and, and but very guarded. So the first time I met him when I was doing Dick Tracy, uh, covering Dick Tracy for Premier in 1989, he, um, you know, he couldn't have been, you know, he immediately 
took me out, you know, asked me to tag along while he went out for lunch with, um, you know, a bunch of his friends, uh, Pat Cadell and so forth. And I was kind of a fly on the wall. He, you know, I, dro- I just, he kept me by his side. You know, I, I traveled, in, you know, he dro- when he had to drive somewhere, I went with him. Um, he, you know, I was at his house for dinner a number of times. He even took me to a um, uh, a doctor's appointment with him, which was a first for me. I thought, you know, hmm. this is interesting. He doesn't have to wait in the waiting room. <laughs> so, um, you know, he, and yet at the same time when I actually sat down to interview him, it was like interviewing, you know, the head of the CIA. You know, he right. would answer a question with a question, or he would tell me part of a, a, a story and not the punchline, or he would just refuse to answer entirely and say that this would hurt somebody's feelings, or he didn't like to talk about such and such a subject. Um, you know, like I'd ask him about um, projects that he had um, started and, and didn't finish or that never were never produced, and he said, I don't like to talk about that, you know, or hmm. I, you know, I don't like to it, it interfere with my creative process. I mean, he always had a reason why he didn't want to talk about something. So, um, you know, it was like shooting a film with a very high shooting ratio. You had to you had to interview him a lot to get a little. So, but he was aware in recent years that you were planning a book about him, and he participated to an extent. How, how long did those conversations run, and, and when did he bow out, and for what reasons, do you think? Well, he, he didn't really bow out. He never bowed out. Um, it just didn't. It didn't, you know, um, happen altogether. I mean, it happened part ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had I first asked him to, um, if if you know that if he ever uh, felt it was the time to you know for someone to write a book about him that I would like to do it. In back in 1989 or 1990, and characteristically, he didn't answer yes or no. And then I would go back to him at periodically over every couple of years and ask him, you know, uh, how about it and. Eventually, he said he wanted to write a book of, of his own, and then mm-hmm. so I just kind of lost interest. You know, he he was produ- you know he was doing less and less movie making. Uh, you know, he had met Annette Bening and they got married and then he had four children, and the films he was making weren't up to you know. Uh, well, no, I sh- shouldn't say that entirely. I mean, I thought Bullworth was a really terrific movie, but yeah. Town and Country, his last movie wasn't very good, and Love Story was a total disaster, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he was doing less and less work, and the and some of the work he was doing wasn't that interesting. So I just sort of gave up, and I was working on other books. And, and then he called me in about 2001 while I was working on um, this book on the independent film world, Down on Dirty Pictures. And he said, uh, remember that book you wanted to write? Well, maybe it's time. So... Um, that came as a total surprise to me, and you know. Then, so then we started discussing it, and one of the things he does, which is rather clever, is after um, bringing the subject up with me, then he turned around and made me sell the idea to him. He suddenly became very skeptical, hmm. you know, uh, and said, "Well, you know, give me a list of five books where um, the subjects have cooperated and they're happy with the book." because it always turns out badly. And, and I think that um, David Geffen book had just come out, which Geffen um, didn't like and um, refused, to, I think he started to refuse to cooperate with it in the middle after beginning, you know, initiating it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I suddenly found myself um, a suppliant, or a supplicant, uh, when in fact he had brought the idea, he had come back to me with the idea. And we negotiated um, for for months, you know, over the phone, um, lunches in L.A. mostly. Uh, I, I, you know, I didn't want to take money from my publisher unless I thought he was going to go through with it. I mean, there was no way of forcing him to. You know, he could say yes and change his mind, and you know, I couldn't make him sign anything. And even if I did, I couldn't enforce it. So I just sort of reached a point, a certain point, reached a comfort level that I thought he would do it. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, and he said he had reasons to do it. You know, he said he was he was concerned about his legacy, and he had his you know his kids. He wanted his kids to to read something that um, you know did his did justice to his work, uh, and, which is perfectly understandable. I mean, he's going to be seventy five in another couple of years. Um, so I thought he had a sufficient reason to do it, 
Uh, and so I started it. Um, uh, although at one point, towards right before I was starting, start, just about to start it, he told me that he one reason he wanted to do, he wanted me to do it because he thought that uh, once it was announced that I was going to do a book on him, that there were two other books in the works that they would those authors would drop out, which mm-hmm. I was kind of a um, thought was crazy and be sort of aghast that he had, you know, in some sense just manipulated me into into in, in the interest of trying to get other people to get rid of other people. Mm. But um, you know, for years everybody had been telling me he was the most manipulative person in the world, so I thought, well, you know, why am I surprised? Uh and then as we proceeded with it, you know, he, he participated intermittently, I would say, you know, when he was in a good mood and he felt like it um, and he didn't have too much, too many other things on his plate. He would do it, and he was in a bad mood and didn't feel like it. He wouldn't. So it was, it was sort of sporadic. It, what's interesting to me about Beatty when I think about, when I think about him, uh, when you reflect on the great actors of the past forty years, maybe this is an unfair assumption, but I would think most people would think De Niro, Pacino. Duval, Hoffman. It takes a while to get to Beatty, even though his contribution in, in this period of film is, is just as immense. Uh, um, why do you think that is? Well, I, th- I think that, um, you know, acting, well, first of all, I think it's true. You know, um, you know he, uh, you know, a lot of people said about him, you know, you know, in his prime that he was a better producer than he was an actor. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think he's a good actor. You know, I think acting didn't come easily to him. I think for a long time he was a little bit like, um, you know, Marlon Brando and people who thought acting was not a serious profession. You know, he uh, initially when he was came to New York from Virginia, he wanted to. I think he wanted to write. Uh, he wanted to direct. You know, he wanted. To, you know, acting was not high on his agenda, and I think he sort of fell into it um, almost inadvertently. I do think he's turned in some very, very good, fine performances. You know, I think mm-hmm. Bonnie and Clyde, he's terrific in that, and he's terrific in Bugsy, which I yeah, think amazing is best, in Bugsy. his best role and best performance. You know, and he also had a much wider wider range than a lot of those people that you mentioned, not so much Dustin, because Dustin has a real comic flair, but Betty has a real talent for comedy, Um you know, which I think he displayed in Heaven Can Wait and uh, um, and, uh, and and Shampoo. Shampoo, yeah. Uh, you know, and I think when he started, he, you know, I think he saw himself like a lot of actors did at that time in the Marlon Brando, James Dean, Montgomery Clift mold. And I think in later years, I think he felt he had more affinity to somebody like Cary Grant. But if it was, oh, he was only an actor, I think his reputation wouldn't be, he wouldn't deserve you know, the attention that, you know, of a major biography. But I think, you know, that he did produce, he did direct, and he did write, right. and he excelled in all those fields. And I think, you know, and he also did a lot of other things. So I think Beatty is somebody for whom the, the, the whole is bigger than some of the parts. Well, he was a he was a hyphenate, as you said, and he wasn't as prolific as these other gentlemen. And also what surprised me about your your portrayal of him in the book is that he never considered himself a character actor like those other guys. He 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 knew his value as a movie star, right? And he kind of t- tailored his image along that vein. Yes, very much so. I mean, he was very very self conscious and analytical about his his image and how to present it in the best possible way. You know, he he would tell you know cinemat- you know the biggest cinematographers of that generation where to, how to light him. Hmm. Where to put the camera, you know, and it was, you know, people were sort of amazed by that. You know, he, you know, he used Serraro and Conrad Hall and um, and, and uh, William Fraker, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and 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 what's his name? Um, what's his, um, Vilmos. Um, uh, uh, yes, but also I was thinking of um, Willis, you know. Uh, Gordon, yeah. Gordon Willis, who did The Godfather, was probably probably the great. Well, maybe he and Serraro the greatest cinematographers of that generation, and he had no hesitation about telling them where to put the camera, where to move it, or when not to move it. Beatty as a collaborator, then, uh, usually at odds with any any director that he worked with. Uh, My favorite Beatty is McCabe, 
and uh, that was not a har- harmonious relationship he had with with Altman on that. He he always had to be in control in some sense. Yes, uh, I mean I think that's true, and you know I think you know God knows you know his need to be in control probably comes from from some sort of you know deep seated. Um, um, you know, uh, f- f- um, some deep-seated seed in his youth, you know, with his family. Mm. But I think when he started out, you know, he was very much in in the thrall of the auteur theory, like everybody was at that, in that generation. So he, you know, he worked, his first film was directed by Kazan, and then he went on to work with um, leading playwrights, William Inge and Tennessee Williams, and some of the leading um, directors like Robert Rawson and uh, uh and John Frankenheimer, and he he and Arthur Penn, and he put himself willingly into their hands. And I think that he discovered that every time he did that, things went wrong. And if he didn't control every aspect of the film, it was going to be a disaster. And I think that's one of the things that propelled him into the, you know, wanting to produce, wanting and wanting to direct. Yeah, he was a lot smarter than a lot of the people he worked with or for. He's a very, very smart guy. I've, you know, rarely met anyone as intelligent as he is. Well, you would yeah. think his 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 uh, prowess as a director himself that he would uh, why, why he would choose to to work with other directors if if he didn't respect their role as director of these films. Well, I, you know, I think he, you know, directing doing everything yourself is really. Uh, it, you know, time-consuming and exhausting. You know, directing mm-hmm. is a very physically exhausting activity, and I think you know, in a lot of ways, it was just easier for him to act and have somebody else direct. And the problem, of course, was always, um, you know, if he was, you know, th- th- could he give up? Could he see control to somebody else? And uh, he did, and he didn't. And uh, the, and then the question is, who do you get if you get a really strong director like Scorsese? who he approached for. He approached, you know, major directors for a lot of his films, and a lot of them just didn't want to work with him because they knew his reputation for controlling the movies, and they wanted to control the movie. So Scorsese told me that they quarreled over Final Cut of Dick Tracy, who was going to have it, and Scorsese ended up dropping out. Mm. But then uh, then on the contrary, if you get a director who is malleable, or you think is malleable, like Glenn Gordon Caron for uh, Love Affair, uh, that can be a disaster as well, or you know, or what's his face who directed um, t- a town and country, Peter Chelsea. Mm-hmm. Um, that can can be a big problem as well because if you're de facto controlling the movie and yet you don't have that authority officially, uh, it was, Beatty knew that it was bad for his reputation to be seen as you know covertly controlling the movie. So um, he was in a he was in a bad position. In, 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 especially in a film like Town and Country. Yeah, the elephant in the room when you when you think about Warren Beatty are his romantic uh, exploits, and I know your book has gotten a lot of press for this aspect. What was the value in investigating this, like you did? What, what does it express about him in, in a larger sense? Well, I mean, I think his, uh, you know, he was a victim. You know, he nurtured this image himself. First of all. It was true. I mean, there's a lot of truth in it. He did, you know, um, was very active, romantically speaking. Uh, but he also nurtured that image because it kept him in the gossip columns. And this was, you know, long before he was a big star. Mm. So um, it helped him. But I think, you know, he got, he got so, became so infamous for it that, you know, he got himself into a lot of hot water with Leslie Caron because. She left her husband, and she had two children, and it sort of turned against him. Um, you know that he was seen as a you know somebody who broke up families and broke right. up marriages. Uh, and then his uh, his reputation for uh, you know for being a Don Juan overshadowed his uh, reputation as a filmmaker. So I think you have to you know in order to understand the sort of problem problematic or the problems that uh, or, or paradoxes that bedeviled him in the course of his career, you have to understand the um, cost, the cost, how much that cost him, uh, that aspect of his life. And at the same time, he used a lot of his girlfriends in his movies. You know, he used yeah. Julie Christie a couple of times. He used uh, Diane Keaton. 
he used Annette Bening. Um, you know, he uh, made movies with, and he used Leslie Caron. He ma- he made movies with these people he was going out with, and that, and you know, to some degree, for example, and that and that affected the movie. So, for some, to some degree, um, Reds reflects the plot of Reds and the performances in Reds reflect his uh, relationship with Diane Keaton. I think it would have been a different movie, possibly with a different actress. Um, mm-hmm. You know, he initially wanted Julie Christie for the role. Um, so that's you can't really understand Betty, I think, without understanding that aspect uh, of his life. Does he long to make a, a, another great film, one last great film? I think he does. I think for somebody as uh, who has as much pride as he did, he does, and who, who saw himself as somebody who you know might run for president, plausibly might run for president or governor of California. Or senator, or senator from California. In other words, a player, a big player, not only in the movie business and world, but on the world, you know, on the political stage. For him to go out with a film as lightweight and uh, as um, town and country is, is right. humiliating. And I think he's competitive. He's always been a very competitive person. He's competitive with people like Clint Eastwood, who gracefully made a transition from leading man to director and is and, and is in some ways antithetical to Beatty, works yeah. quickly, makes decisions quickly, and he's made a lot of very good films since he stopped being a leading man, and I think Beatty would like to, to go out on a big movie, and he should. Yeah, and and that movie might, uh, as you write in your book, it, it could be Howard Hughes? Would that it be? be Howard, yes, it yeah. could be Howard Hughes. Another great, enigmatic <laughs> figure. Uh, yeah, that, yeah. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. I mean, a lot of the people who, you know, there have been many, many Hughes, Howard Hughes scripts, and you know, I did interview Bo Goldman, who wrote essentially wrote Dick Tracy and wrote mm-hmm. a Howard Hughes script for him. And Goldman talks a lot about the the things that Beatty and Howard Hughes have in common, and so it's a it's a um, you know it's a natural um, it's a natural subject for him, and a great subject for him. I think he could do a great job with it. I think so, too, yeah. B- before I let you go, um, the independent film movement, which you wrote about so so eloquently in Down in Dirty Pictures, how has it changed since you wrote that book? I, I You know, a lot of the studios bought up their own specialty labels, and those have gone belly up or shut their doors altogether in recent years. Where do you see the, the landscape of indie, indie film now? Well, you know, I... I as you as you point out, it collapsed. You know, after um, you know after that book closed. I mean, in other words, um, you know, I, I think I published that book in 2003. It was writing up to the very last minute, and I think the seeds. That, I mean, the things that happened subsequently, um, you could see that the seeds were already planted. You know, the, mm-hmm. the heyday of independent film studios started the indie indie divisions, and then. Um, there were so many of them, and so much money was going into indie films that I think that, that you know there was a sort of gridlock in the marketplace. Plus, um, the the films that were made by the indie divisions, as the budgets kept going up, became more and more like studio films. And so the uh, the idios- idiosyncrasy of of independent films eventually disappeared. And um, and then the and and then people. You know, my view, you know, the audience started staying away. There were too many films, and they weren't good enough. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there are other explanations for it. And, you know, then came the financial crunch, and everybody's cutting back. And, you know, you can't, a studio can't make as much, even an indie film that does well, with the budgets going up and attendance plateauing off, you can't do as well on an indie film or, or a pseudo-indie film, a Hollywood, you know, um, an indie wood film, so-called, as you can on some of these big blockbusters. And you know, but on the other hand, I do think that with all the ch- technological changes and the changes in distribution and the internet, and the fact that you can make a film for a dollar and a half now is all to the good. Mm-hmm. And that um, you know, there are a lot of pe- people coming up, talented people coming up, and you know, this stuff is always cyclical. And you will see another resurgence of independent film before too long. Do you think this has been this past year in movies? Do you, do you think it was a, a good year? No, I think it was a bad year. I mean, there yeah. were some good films made this year, but not very many. I mean, you know, I liked, uh, you know, I think, like everybody else, I guess, I loved Hurt Locker. 
and mm-hmm. um, you know I thought up in the air was pretty good, but you know I didn't like much else, and uh, and I haven't seen Avatar. I can't quite bring myself <laughs> having uh, had it with large green men, large blue men, with, uh, <laughs> the, watch, the Watchmen, right? Uh, which I was very disappointed in. So. You know, I'm, I'm going to see it, but I haven't rushed out to see it. And um, and uh, but aside from that, um, you know, I think it's few, the, film, the good films this year are few and far between. Yeah, it's it, what timing to to expand your best picture to ten. Uh, it's interesting to see how they'll fill those ten. Yes, exactly. Well, yeah. I think you know there are films like um, Crazy Heart, which is which is pretty good, not great, but you know mm-hmm. respectable. You know, there are, pl- there are a lot of films like that that I think... You know, it's funny that I, I, I do a film, f- run a film festival up in where I live in uh, upstate New York, and every year, you know, when I start, it's like 10 years old, and when I started the, the American Independent Films, the presence was very strong, and now for the last four or five years, the, the foreign films are way better than the American films. There's just no mm. comparison. Um, mm. And I think that's a, that shows you, so, tells you something. 